welcome to this lecture we are going to continue about norms norms of signals we have already seen we are going to see in more detail about systems which we are going to consider as operators yeah so we are going to see in more detail about this in particular we are going to speak about finite gain L2 stable, a very important class of stable systems. This is what we will see in more detail today. We had just begun in the previous lecture. So, we uh, saw that if this is a system, input output system, there are various notions of stability, and we are speaking of input output stability in which U's and Y's live in some space of signals we said a good space of signals is L 2 E. Yeah, L 2 E is a rich space of signals. For example, there are e to the power plus t, e to the power n e, 5 t etcetera. These are all there inside L 2 E R they are all growing you see these signals are all growing and they are not in L 2 for that for that reason why simply because they are all growing and they are not going to be square integrable. But for each chopped version at whatever tau one chops the chopped version is in L 2 yeah. So, we uh, recall that the definition of L 2 e was you take and put a you take a function f and put it into L 2 e if f tau is in L 2 for every chopped f tau. So, uh, now one can also speak of L 2 e 0 to infinity to R m. Here we are considering functions that are defined over the domain 0 to plus infinity not from minus infinity to plus infinity like in this, but from 0 to infinity like in this. So, we define a system H with input u output y to be finite gain L 2 stable. So, H is called finite gain L 2 stable. L 2 plays a key role in the norm that we are taking. If there exist there exist constants gamma and beta yeah so this one is not y but gamma and this one is beta such that such that what inequality satisfied y so notice which one we are putting at various places is less than or equal to u. The inequality that I am writing in now is not yet correct, we will correct it very soon. Gamma, this one is gamma for every for every u in L 2 e. So, notice that if u is in L 2 e, then its L 2 norm need not be defined. Yeah? Uh, of course, L 2 space of functions is contained inside L 2 e, but you take arbitrary u in L 2 e, its L 2 norm is not defined. L 2 norm of which functions are defined after chopping by tau. So, uh, notice that you have to chop by tau, chop at value tau, then it comes into L 2 space and then the L 2 norm is defined. Yeah? For a and for, for every for every tau greater than or equal to 0. Yeah? So, you chop and then it is in L 2, but then the right hand side you might chop at different different values of tau and if you chop very late then the right hand side might become large, if you chop very early the right hand side might become very small. So, notice that you should also be chopping at the same value here. Yeah? So, here also y will be in L 2 after this chop. So, 
now is when this equation has lot of meaning. So, how much energy comes? So, we are going to chop at tau and how much energy comes in the output? Yeah, so why we are measuring the output energy in the output and energy so far this tau you chop by tau and then take the L 2 norm means you look at the energy that has come out so far that energy cannot exceed the energy that went in times a constant the energy that went in so far times a constant and perhaps an offset this offset beta is not very important you should understand this offset beta as suppose you do not give any energy inside you do not give any energy input u at all if 0 is the input then this this particular term becomes 0 then the output can can still be non zero but it has to be bounded for every tau whatever comes out is bounded by some number beta yeah so the energy that comes out for every tau is bounded by some fixed constant beta so gamma and beta are some fixed constants that are not allowed to be changed depending on the particular u that you take from L 2 e and the particular tau at which you decide to chop the independent of which u and which tau the same gamma and beta has to work for this inequality to hold that is the significance of this particular result. So, we will uh, see some consequences of this inequality. First consequence is when, when u is equal to 0 u is identically equal to 0 this should be understood as identically not just equal to 0 at some time instant, but equal to 0 at every time instant yeah u u of t equal to 0 for all for all t all our signals are defined only for t greater than or equal to 0 and hence u of t equal to 0 for all t greater than or equal to 0. Then what this says is y tau L 2 less than or equal to beta for there is no u anyway for every tau. So, in particular you can make this tau very large for every tau for every positive tau you can make this tau tend to infinity and still it will be bounded. So, this implies that y itself is in L 2 why because for every tau the chopped version is bounded by some number beta independent beta itself is not allowed to depend on beta yeah the beta itself is not allowed to depend on the tau and hence this L 2 norm of the chopped y is independent of the tau and hence y itself has to be in L 2 this is not very hard to prove, but what this says is that when you give 0 input then the energy in the output is finite the energy in the output is finite not just when you take the energy so far until now, but also when you integrate up to plus infinity. So, what does this say in terms of L T i system that is what we will see in very de in much detail very soon now also let us see some more consequences. So, beta should be understood as some offset in output energy due to non zero initial condition for example, there might be an initial condition inside the system. This, this might cause the output to be non zero even though the input is identically zero. Yeah. So, the significance of beta you have already understood when the input is zero that time the output can still have some energy, but the output's energy cannot exceed beta for any tau and hence y itself will be in L 2 for the special case that zero is the input. Now, let us understand in more detail let us look at this inequality again of course, plus beta. So, if you give some finite amount of energy into the system from the input then the output will also have some energy, but the output's energy is expected to be more if input input more energy is given into the through the uh, to the system from the input. Yeah. So, for linear systems also if you give more energy into the system of course, output should be allowed to give output should be allowed to have more energy in its output in the output signal should be allowed to have more energy, but the outputs energy cannot exceed some constant times the input energy this kind of quantifies that all the energy that comes in the output has to have gone in through the input plus some constant 
which is perhaps because of non zero initial conditions this kind of also quantifies that the system h itself is not does not have a source of energy inside why this rules out a source of energy within because if there is a source of energy within even when you give zero input the output can have lot of energy outside that is being ruled out by this fact that when you give zero identical when you give input identically zero then the output energy is bounded from above by a value beta of course what remained to say was that gamma and beta are greater than zero but that easily uh, follows you see left hand side is some positive number l2 norm because it's a norm it is non negative quantity and hence the right hand side is also non negative both gamma and beta have to be positive numbers because this u itself is also positive uh, beta is positive follows by taking the fact that u itself might be identically zero and hence the left hand side is non negative hence right hand side is also non negative so this is how we should understand this finite gain l2 stable notion of stability so what is finite gain about it this gamma is like a gain of the system yeah the way we have defined it here we have called the system h finite gain l2 stable l2 played a role because of the particular norm l2 norm that we took here hence u and y were taken from l2 e and gamma is a gain of the system is it okay to say the gain is it unique are gamma and beta unique we already noted in the previous lecture that if one gamma and beta pair works anything gamma larger than yeah if gamma 1 comma beta 1 works when when we say works it should say works for all for all u in l2 e and for all choppings tau then gamma 2 comma beta 2 will also work yeah also works also works where as long as you take gamma 2 greater than or equal to gamma 1 and beta 2 greater than or equal to beta 1 this pair will also work yeah so clearly this is not unique one might try to say why, what is the minimum gamma for which this inequality holds that minimum gamma is uh, the minimum gamma for which this inequality holds for all u and for all tau that is reasonable to be called the gain of the system yeah the infimum such gamma but then we do not need that concept in more detail hence we are going to see the l2 norm the gain of the system only for lti systems ciso some consider some ciso transfer function for example take s plus 1 over s plus 2 so this particular system yeah is it stable yeah it has its poles in the left half complex plane this is a zero this is a pole minus 2 minus 1 so in this particular uh, for this transfer function this is stable so this is does that exist does that exist gamma and beta such that such that for this system yeah s plus 1 over s plus 2 for this system this as i said this beta depends on the initial condition let's assume that the initial condition is equal to 0 Yeah, if the initial condition is more, and of course more energy will come out in the output, even when zero is when the input is zero, identically zero, and hence this beta is playing a role because the initial condition also could be sitting inside and it could be non-zero. But we are going to consider the case that the initial condition is equal to zero, and hence we will not be considering beta, the role that beta plays. That is a relatively easier issue anyway. So we are going to see what is the minimum gamma that that allows us to call that minimum gamma as the so called L2 induced norm of the system. So this L2 induced norm has a very important significance. It is also uh, the peak value of the Bode magnitude plot. That is what we will see in detail now. So it is well known. Consider again this transfer function s plus one over s plus two. this is how the bode plot looks magnitude of g of 
j omega in the log scale yeah in log scale also this is in in log scale it starts increasing at the 0 1 radians per second and it stops increasing at 2 radians per second yeah at a pole so these are the cutoff frequencies so notice that the peak value is equal to 1 which is 0 db and this corresponds to 1 by 2 now yeah, for s equal to 0 s equal to 0 which is a dc gain this norm this gain is 1 by 2 and as s tends to infinity which is the gain as uh, at very high frequencies this is equal to 1 at as s tends to infinity you see uh, this constant terms do not play a role because the leading coefficients are equal and hence it becomes tends to 1. The degrees are also same, it is by proper the numerator and denominator degrees are equal to each other. So, this is uh, tends to 1. Hmm? So, max. So, we can ask what is the question? The L2 induced norm. What is induced about it? So, we take the system G. is defined as yeah, induced norm. This is G is not a si signal, we define L 2 norm of signals so far, but now we are going to define a so called induced norm. Yeah, this is not the L 2 norm that you saw so far, we are defining norm of an operator of a system that takes input u, output y and has a transfer function like we had h so far. Now, we have an LTI system with a transfer function g, hence we are defining its L 2 norm. Uh, with g here as outputs l 2 norm divided by inputs l 2 norm. Of course, this ratio it is reasonable to call this as the gain of the system, but this ratio might be different for different different inputs that you give. Yeah? Even though it is being scaled by the inputs, it is being divided by the energy in the input, but still this ratio might depend on what, what frequency you have concentrated your energy in. So, we are going to look at the supremum over all u in L 2 yeah? and of course, u should not be equal to, uh, you should not be equal to 0 because otherwise you will have 0 in the denominator. So, this supremum, supremum only means that it is like the maximum, but we are not looking at the maximum value over a finite set. L 2 is a very large set not a compact set and hence we are uh, replacing max by sup, sup is just supremum. So, this ratio, the, this ratio indicates the maximum amplification that the system G can cause to an input u and this amplification is being measured in terms of the L 2 norms. The, these, notice that these L 2, this L 2 and this L 2 here stand for signals, for systems, for signals that you have already seen and hence this is what you already understood unlike here where this is the L 2 norm being used for a system G. Yeah? So, by using the ratio of L 2 norms of in output divided by input and then the taking the supremum over all such signals u, we have used that to induce a notion of norm for an operator G. So, this induced norms have also have those properties that we indicated so far like triangle inequality and the norm being at least greater than or equal to 0 and the norm is equal to 0 only when the operator itself is 0. Further, if you scale the operator by some number, then the L 2 norm also gets scaled by uh, absolute value of that number. All these properties are satisfied for norm in addition to some more properties called sub, sub multiplicative property that we do not need in much detail in this course. When we need it, we will see. So, L the induced norm is defined like this. It turns out that this norm will uh, meet the purpose of the gamma written there. Yeah? So, let gamma be defined as the induced norm, L 2 induced norm. Since we have used L 2 for an operator, it is understood that this L 2 is not of a system, not of a signal, but the induced norm that we use and induced refers to taking the ratio of the outputs L 2 norm divided by the inputs L 2 norm. So, since this one was defined as supremum over all u in L 2 of outputs L 2 norm divided by inputs L 2 norm, since we took this as a ratio, we are now going to quickly see 
that this induced norm will serve the purpose of the gamma. So, define gamma as this L 2 induced norm. When this L 2 has been used in the context of a system of an operator, then we are going to understand it as obviously being the induced norm. Now, from the context it is clear because G is not a signal, it is a system. Hence, this L 2 here refers to the supremum that we just now defined of the outputs L 2 norm divided by the inputs L 2 norm. Yeah, of course, we have not yet seen whether this is whether this is finite, whether it exists or not. Yeah, but you take the supremum of this ratio supremum over what? Supremum over all u in L 2 means you vary this u for different different values in different different signals in L 2 and look at this ratio and ensure that the denominator is not equal to 0 that is ensured by taking u unequal to 0 unequal to the signal that is identically 0 and this we will define as gamma. What this means is that the supremum of y L 2 is less than or equal to is is equal to gamma times u l 2 yeah l 2 norm of the input. If the maximum the supremum is as good as the maximum you see as I said it almost reaches this it is not attained that is the only concern. So, if the supremum is equal to this then any other is less than or equal to gamma times u l 2 norm of u. Yeah. Why this inequality has come? Because this gamma was defined as a supremum. Yeah, what all we did is we took this denominator from this side to that side, and we wrote this inequality, this equality, gamma equal to supremum of y L2 norm divided by u L2 norm. That is what we have multiplied and written here because we know that the denominator is unequal to zero, and if the supremum of the left hand side is equal to this, you if you get rid of the supremum, then this inequality ends up coming. Yeah. Now, th this is true for all u in L 2 that is how we have obtained back that inequality we started with except that one might say that what happened to the E the extended that extended has not come because we have already assumed that this ratio exists. Yeah, This ratio could easily have been unbounded it might not have existed it might be very large and infinity infinite. So, this ratio this is finite if and only if g is stable that is what we are going to see in detail now. So, when g has no poles in the right of plane nor does it have poles on the imaginary axis that is when this gamma will exist. So, g L 2 is defined as supremum over all u in L 2 of y L 2 norm L 2 norm and u one equal to 0. Yeah, the sup sup exists. Sup meaning supremum. Yeah, sup is just short form for supremum. Supremum exists if and only if if and important result if and only if G has no poles in closed right half plane. Right half complex plane. If G has no poles in the closed right half complex plane, what is right half? Of course, that is clear. What is closed about it? No poles on the imaginary axis either. Yeah, All the poles are in the open left half complex plane. What is open about it? The boundary of the left half complex plane is the imaginary axis. The boundary has not been included. That is what makes it open left half complex plane. So, to say all the poles are in the open left half complex plane is same as saying there are no poles in the closed right half complex plane. The right half complex plane is where I put my fingers. To say closed means it includes its boundary. The imaginary axis is its boundary. If it has no poles in the closed right half complex plane, that is when we will call G also as her widths. And this property G has no poles in the right half complex plane is also called her widths. Yeah, her width also depends on the context and in this context it means when g is rational when g is uh, ratio of two polynomials g having no poles in the closed right half complex plane 
is also called as Hurwitz. That is precisely the case when this supremum that we have defined here is a finite value. Yeah, the supremum could easily become infinity. Yeah, why? Because the numerator might become unbounded even though the denominator is uh, finite. That is when this ratio need not exist. It might become very large and infinite. That is when we will say L2 norm does not exist. When will the L2 norm exist? When is this supremum finite? when is it bounded? It is bounded precisely when G has no poles in the right half complex plane nor does it have poles on the imaginary axis. Yeah, these are, this is precisely the case that the L2 norm exists. In that case, you give a u in L2, the output will also be in L2 and hence this ratio will exist and that justifies, let us go back to our previous slide, that just for that case this gamma is finite and hence this inequality holds for all u in L2. Yeah, the L2 E, we did not have to write the E because this holds for all U in L2 itself. So, now let us look at the notion of gain for some more systems. Uh, what is the meaning of this maximum? So, well known. There are many, it is also called R H infinity, hmm? well known result if G has no poles in closed right half plane, which means G has all poles in open left half complex plane and if G is proper yeah, this proper is another condition I forgot uh, in the previous slide. That is properness is also required if we do not want, uh, if we want G to have a finite L2 norm. If we want the induced L2 norm of G to be finite, then G has to uh, have all its poles in the left half complex plane, in the open left half complex plane. Further, G also has to be proper. This proper is same as saying denominator degree. greater than or equal to numerator degree. This means that G is proper which means that as S tends to infinity G S exists, G infinity is a finite number. Yeah? What is well known is that the L in L 2 induced norm that we defined is equal to is attained is in fact attained on the imaginary axis. Yeah? The supremum value supremum over omega in R of G of G omega. Consider for the case that G is CISO. When G is single input, single output, that and this max L2 induced norm is nothing but supremum over all omega in R of G of G omega. This is a very important well known result and what is R H infinity that I have written here? R stands for real rational, those transfer functions G which is a ratio of two real polynomials, polynomials whose coefficients are all real that is what R stands for and H infinity stands for those uh, transfer functions which are proper and have all their poles in the open left half complex plane. Yeah? H, H is in memory of a person called Hardy who uh, worked a lot in uh, such spaces and many others and is a close associate of well known Ramanujan. So, the, this class of transfer functions G which are real rational and which have all their poles in the open left half complex plane, it is well known that the L2 induced norm that we defined is equal to just the supremum of this particular value here. Yeah? Take the absolute value of G at different different points on the imaginary axis and look at the supremum over all these points on the imaginary axis. So, that is what brings us to the Bode plot, the Bode magnitude plot to be precise. So, supremum over all omega in R of G of J omega, so this is a complex quantity, we take the absolute value. This to do this is nothing but, suppose this is the Bode magnitude plot, 
then this supremum this value here suppose this value is equal to 8 then we will say this is a Bode magnitude plot why will this be finite because g has no poles on the imaginary axis yeah because g has no poles on the imaginary axis nor is g proper nor is g improper because g is proper as s tends as for as omega tends to infinity it either slopes down which is the case when g is strictly proper the denominator degree is strictly more than the numerator degree or it saturates yeah it can saturate to a value different from the dc gain if g is bi proper to say it saturates means as omega tends to infinity it is a non zero finite value and uh, to say it is finite means g is proper the numerator degree does not exceed the denominator degree and to say that it is non zero means the two degrees are equal yeah so it will either come down like this with some roll off roll off that depends on the difference in the degrees of the numerator and denominator or it will saturate to some value for the case that the degrees are equal so, this peak value is finite as soon as these two cases are satisfied. G has no poles on the imaginary axis and G is proper. But what is the value of the peak? That is equal to 8. This peak will indeed be equal to the L2 induced norm precisely when G has no poles in the right half complex plane also. Yeah? Supremum of G of G omega, supremum overall omega in R exists when G has no poles on the imaginary axis and two conditions are required and G is proper. Yeah? So, this supremum when will it exist? It could easily become infinity, it could become infinity for it will become infinity for example, if G has poles on the imaginary axis in which case this goes off this becomes very large it becomes unbounded the body magnitude plot. So, if g has no poles on the image axis at no finite value omega does it become unbounded and if g is proper then as omega tends to infinity also it does not become unbounded. So, when these two conditions are satisfied that time the supremum exists to say it exists means it is a finite value, but just because it exists does not make it does not make the supremum equal to the L 2 induced norm. When is it equal to the L 2 induced norm? When supremum g j omega exists and if g has no poles in the open left half complex plane, open left half complex plane has poles have not got op, sorry no open open right half no poles yeah, no poles in the open right half complex plane this has got ruled out image axis already got ruled out because supremum exists yeah then then the supremum is equal to the l2 induced norm this is a frequency domain condition and what i write here is a time domain So, you look at the system u, the system g, the input u, output y equal to, we are going to say it is just g u, g acting on u. For this system, you look at the outputs L2 norm divided by the inputs L2 norm. This L2 norm is what we defined in the time domain for the signal. So, this right hand side quantity is a supremum over all L2 signals and u not equal to 0. That ratio we have taken in the time domain that is equal to this frequency domain condition the peak value of the Bode magnitude plot for these two to be equal we want g to have no poles in the open right half complex plane. The left hand side exists as soon as g has no poles on the imaginary axis nor no g has no poles on the imaginary axis and g is proper. In that case the left hand side exists and it will become equal to the right hand side when g has no poles in the open right half plane also. So, here are some exercises. Yeah. So, find, find L2, L2 norm of a system means it is the induced norm of G equal to S over S plus 1 
एस प्लस वन ओवर एस एस प्लस वन एंड एस प्लस थ्री ओवर एस माइनस थ्री या वट आर दिस वैल्यूज इक्वल टू प्लीज टेक योर टाइम एंड कैलकुलेट टू गेट फॉर दिस द वैल्यू इज इक्वल टू वन या जी ऑफ एस इक्वल टू दिस दीज एल टू इंड्यूज नॉम ऑफ दिस इज इक्वल टू वन दिस डज नॉट एग्जिस्ट या ही ऑल्सो डज नॉट एग्जिस्ट प्लीज टेक योर टाइम टू फाइंड आउट वाई दे डू नॉट एग्जिस्ट these do not exist yeah these all three don't exist this is because there is a pole on the imagined axis this is because it's improper here because the there is a pole in the right half complex plane yeah but for each of these four cases also please check for which case the supremum of g of j omega as i said the supremum could exist under milder conditions under what condition does this exist right this supremum need not be equal to the l2 induced norm of g it will be equal only under certain conditions and for which of these four cases does this exist yeah of course it will be equal to this for this case but for the other three cases is what requires a thorough investigation so we have we have seen some examples of transfer functions and when they have a finite l2 induced norm what what remained to be told is a very important word l2 induced norm has another name yeah just it is only a different name that is also called as so called h infinity norm h infinity what is h infinity norm it is nothing but the l2 induced norm for single input single output systems it it is nothing but peak value of bode magnitude plot yeah for single input single output systems it is very easy to calculate it it is the equal to the peak value of the bode magnitude plot this peak value exists if uh, g has no poles on the imaging axis it is equal to l2 induced norm when g has no poles on the imagine axis when g is proper and g has no poles in the right half complex plane yeah under that condition is when the h infinity norm equivalently the l2 induced norm exists and is finite that time it will be equal to the peak value yeah the peak value is what is equal to the h infinity norm precisely when g is stable when g has all its poles in the left half complex plane and also when g is proper so what is this peak value it has another significance yeah for the case that g is stable g is stable one can also look at its nyquist plot so let's suppose this is the nyquist plot yeah of course it is symmetric about the imaging axis with some orientation let's say this is a complex plane nyquist plot at at any omega this is where g of j omega is yeah for the nyquist plot is nothing but a map of the imaginary axis under the action of g yeah this is a j omega the imaginary axis it gets mapped under g to this particular contour with a orientation of course this closed contour gets mapped to this closed contour in some orientation important orientation and there is this point minus 1 and we can ask at each point what is the distance of that g of j omega from the origin the peak value is nothing but the maximum distance yeah this is absolute value of g of j omega it's just a complex number at any omega g of j omega is a complex number and absolute value is its distance from the origin so supremum is nothing but the maximum distance as you go as you traverse along the nyquist plot and you have never gone to infinity this point is not gone to infinity precisely because g has no poles on the imaging axis and also because g is proper in that case this contour will be a closed contour and that time one can look at uh, the peak distance from the origin so the supremum overall omega in r is nothing but 
farthest point of Nyquist plot farthest from what? Farthest from the origin. From the origin. This is the significance with the Nyquist plot. Of course, we will see this in little more detail very soon. So, we are going to after this development of L2 induced norm, we are close to seeing an example called the small gain theorem. So, uh, for that purpose, we need to see the notion of feedback interconnection being stable. Let us think of one of them with a negative sign. Uh, for the feed, for the small gain theorem, it doesn't matter whether this is plus or minus. Hmm? Suppose H one and H two are finite gain L two stable. Yeah, finite gain L2 stable means there exists comma this this particular symbol with a E reversed means there exists there exists gamma 1 beta 1 for this is for H1 and gamma 2 comma beta 2 for H2 such that what inequality is satisfied this inequality is what we have seen several times today already y1 chopped L2 norm is less than or equal to gamma 1 times E1 chopped L2 norm plus beta 1. Similarly, the same inequality for H2, which, which puts an inequality between the L2 norm of Y2 chopped and L2 norm of E2 chopped related by gamma 2 instead of gamma 1. So, So, we can ask the question is the feedback interconnection stable yeah that, that is the question that we are trying to answer. So, before we come to that question look at this feedback interconnection yeah we have already assumed that h 1 is L 2 gain finite gain L 2 stable we have assumed that h 1 is finite gain L 2 stable we have assumed that h 2 is also finite gain L 2 stable and we want to ask is the interconnection also finite gain L 2 stable. What now the question arises what does it mean for the interconnection to be finite gain L 2 stable. To say that the interconnection is finite gain L 2 stable means that the map with u 1 u 2 as the input to y 1 y 2 as the output. Yeah, We can think of this interconnected system as a map as a system which takes u 1 u 2 as the input and gives you output y 1 y 2. Of course, you might say should the output be y 1 y 2 or should the output be e 1 e 2 both are ok or you can also consider u 1 u 2 as the input and all 4 signals as the output. But if this map from u 1 u 2 to all these signals is also finite gain L 2 stable then we will say this feedback interconnection is finite gain L 2 stable this is an important concept. So, let me just recap this concept. Feedback interconnection, interconnection is called stable. Here, by, by this word stable, here we mean finite gain L2 stable. If, if what is satisfied? u 1 u 2 y 1 y 2 map is finite gain stable is finite gain L 2 stable. Yeah, this particular map from the input u 1 u 2 
to the outputs y1 y2 if this map is also finite gain l2 stable then we will say that this feedback interconnection is stable is finite gain l2 stable which feedback interconnection this feedback this feedback interconnection you might ask why take outputs y1 y2 it can be shown that if you if the map from u1 u2 to y1 y2 is finite gain l2 stable then the map from u1 u2 to e1 e2 is also finite gain l2 stable these are equivalent yeah so between y1 y2 and e1 e2 you can take any one pair as the output if you want to take all four of them both pairs that is that's also okay but it's not okay to take just e1 e1 y1 yeah one should take uh, cross y1 y2 or e1 e2 so this is the meaning that feedback interconnection stable now we want to ask the question under what conditions on h1 h2 will we have stability of the feedback interconnection stability of the feedback interconnection as i said here is finite gain l2 stable from this these inputs u1 u2 these are like being injected at the interconnection points yeah there is also a notion of well posedness of interconnection well posedness of interconnection means that u1 u2 are genuinely are inputs and as soon as u1 u2 inputs are given rest all outputs are determined rest all variables are outputs means that they all get determined as soon as u1 u2 get determined so to say that this feedback interconnection is well defined to say that it is well posed means for every u1 u2 input there is a unique output e1 y1 e2 y2 all these four are unique so we have already assumed that this particular feedback interconnection is well defined after it is well defined we have introduced the notion of feedback interconnection being stable feedback interconnection being stable means that this interconnection finite gain l2 stable the map from u1 u2 to y1 y2 is feedback is finite gain l2 stable so for that for this feedback interconnection to be finite gain l2 stable we are going to see a sufficient condition so for that sufficient condition we have assumed that both h1 h2 are finite gain l2 stable to say that h1 h2 are finite gain l2 stable is that there exists gamma 1 beta 1 gamma 2 beta 2 such that these two inequalities are satisfied yeah we are seeing an example one sufficient condition for the feedback interconnection to be stable of course the feedback interconnection can be stable in when several other conditions are also satisfied not necessarily this this is just an example of one sufficient condition what is that sufficient condition suppose gamma 1 gamma 2 product is strictly less than 1 yeah product of gamma 1 gamma 2 is strictly less than 1 then if this is satisfied then feedback interconnection is finite gain l2 stable yeah so this is called the small gain theorem what is the small gain theorem it is a example it is a sufficient condition for the feedback interconnection to be stable that sufficient condition is as follows that we consider this feedback interconnection suppose it turns out that h1 h2 are themselves finite gain l2 stable to say that they are themselves finite gain l2 stable means that these two inequalities are true of course for all for all e in l2 e and for for all e1 for all choppings greater than or equal to 0 and here for all e2 in l2 e yeah this this particular symbol is for all it is currently commonly used to say for all for every under the condition that h1 h2 are both finite gain l2 stable and if the product is strictly less than 1 then one can also guarantee that the feedback interconnection is also finite gain l2 stable yeah this is a sufficient condition for the finite gain for the feedback interconnection to be finite gain l2 stable and this theorem is called the small gain theorem yeah one can understand the small gain theorem like this yeah Uh, consider this feedback interconnection again remove u1 u2 start from e1 go to y1 the maximum gain that can happen is gamma 1 yeah then you go from here to here the maximum gain is gamma 
so when uh, forget the minus sign multiplication by minus sign does not really change the gain gain of the minus 1 is nothing but plus 1 when you go round this loop how much amplification has occurred from here to here by gamma 1 there is this plus u2 there is no u2 from here to here it's gamma 2 but the product of gamma 1 gamma 2 is strictly less than 1 so when one traverses the traverses the loop completely and comes back here the net magnification is strictly less than 1 the extremely important point to note that you traverse the loop and come back to the same point the maximum amplification that can occur is strictly less than 1 if somebody assures us that the maximum amplification that can occur is strictly less than 1 then the small gain theorem assures us that this feedback interconnection is finite gain L2 stable and for that maximum amplification to be strictly less than 1 notice that this plus sign or minus sign does not matter why because multiplication by minus 1 does not change the maximum amplification at all because the gain of the operator minus 1 is again equal to plus 1 due to that reason. So, this completes this topic about norms of various signals, norms of an operator. We have seen what is the meaning of uh, the finite gain L2 stable in the context of LTI systems. For that case, we have seen that it is nothing but all poles in the left half complex plane, in the open left half complex plane and G is proper. For that case, we have seen that the L2 induced norm, which is also called the H infinity norm is nothing but the peak value of the Bode magnitude plot. Yeah. So, uh, this and this peak value of the Bode magnitude plot is nothing but the uh, distance of the farthest point of the Nyquist plot farthest from the origin, the distance from the origin. So, this completes uh, this important topic and this is required for various other topics. We will continue with the next topic in the next lecture. Thank you.